So I'm recording this, so hopefully I'll link it to the website and also WinBiz as well. I've only got a small screen, so hopefully everybody can see it. Those that are particularly visual, then move closer so you can see it. Those of you who are just auditory people, um, you can just listen. Uh, for those of you who are kinesthetic feelings, you can just relax. And for those of you who are digital people, you can take notes. So, <laughs> <laughs> so everybody knows I like stories. I, get, I tell a story just before I start talking about the Bandura curve. Now, when I was young, I used to enjoy playing cricket at school. And my favourite part of playing cricket was bowling. I was very accurate and I had good technique. The only downside was is that I was incredibly slow at bowling. So I remember when it came to my turn, all the kids used to say, stand back, because even the worst batsman could probably get a four. <laughs> so what I decided to do was practice at home. It became become the Easter holidays. I used to have a friend who came around, so I used to practice bowling and playing cricket with him. And when and no friends were about, I used to just practice in the garden. It was about the right length to practice the bowling. Got a bit faster and actually started doing leg spin and actually became quite good. So excitedly, when school restarted, I thought to myself, excellent. Now it's my time to shine, to show what I can do. I'll come back to that later, though. <laughs> <laughs> we all know a saying, and where the dots are, if you can fill it in for, for, for me. So anything worth doing is worth doing. OK, we'll come back to that later as well. <laughs> so. This is Dr. Albert Bandura. He's a psychologist at Stanford University, California. And he looked at the relationship between people's beliefs and expectations to how well they performed in a given task. So some of the tasks he would get people to do would be something quite simple at the beginning, throw in, say, 10 wads of paper into a waste paper basket. And he would say to them, how many do you think you're going to get in? And some people would say about five. Some people would be even less. Um, and what he actually found that people tended to perform around their expectation levels. He would also get people to do not just throwing wads of paper, but more complex mathematical problems. And also, if somebody had a phobia like a fear of snakes, he would then get them to just rate how well they would deal come in face to face with something like a boa constrictor. With this, he would also measure their reaction time to how they reacted to that question. So if they yeah, I'd be OK, but there was like quite a delay before they said that, that also gave an indication. And as I said, people tended to perform around expectations. So for example, if somebody said they're only going to get three wads of paper into the waste paper basket while throwing, but indeed got six, Instead of thinking to themselves, oh, I guess I can actually do better than I thought, they would think, oh, it was just beginner's luck. And because of that, when they came to do it again, because of their expectations, their skill level actually went down. However, the reverse effect was also true. If somebody said, I'm going to get eight in there and only got about three, they would think, I know I can do much better. So when they tried, their performance level would actually go up. Most people, when dealing with a task they've never done before, have quite low expectations. So here I've got uh, some snooker players, and I used to also play snooker, and used to be in a snooker team going back many years ago. And a lot of my friends were interested, but they would say, you know, I wouldn't do that well, and I know I'll just rip the cloth, as you can see in this diagram. And I used to say to people, well, don't worry, only an idiot would actually rip the cloth. It's impossible to do. I ripped the cloth not long after saying that, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> but we know about beliefs and expectations. We've all heard of the placebo effect. Now, the placebo effect is where somebody is given just a sugar pill and told it's a drug that, for example, will help eczema. Just even though there's no substance in it which should help the eczema, their eczema quite often tends to get better just purely from the belief and expectation of the person. And I don't know if you can read it here, but uh, it says here, this gentleman is pointing to the board saying, our trials show that the new drug performs no better than placebo. And somebody says, maybe we should invest in placebos. Sometimes, even surprisingly, a placebo will actually be better and have better results than the actual drug 
being tested, and I think this is probably due to the fact there's no nasty side effects with the placebo. So, high expectations, if somebody's got high expectations, their skill level performance will rise. So, Dr. Albert Dern, being a psychologist, would also help to raise people's expectations. So, what are the four ways he would get people to raise their expectations to improve their performance? One, verbal persuasion. Two, expert modelling. Three, vicarious learning. And four, inactive mastery. Let's look at each one of these more in detail. So, verbal persuasion. Just basically saying to somebody, you can do it. Having that, giving that belief in somebody that you believe in them. You can also do this to yourself as well by pumping yourself up. However, Albert Bandeau actually found that out of the four, this was the least effective. I think as well also in NLP you have what are called external people. So an external person would be somebody, if you were to ask somebody, how do you know you've done a good job? An external person may say to you, I get told, I get a slap on the back. If you're internal referenced, then it will be, I know I've done a good job because I just get that feeling I've done a good job. They're more internal. So this probably works better for more external people. Second one, expert modelling. This is modelling somebody who is an expert in the field, knowing that the human body is possible at going that far and being that good. I've chosen Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers here for the example, but it could be with sports people, people that are very successful in business etc people that um, are experts at communicating but however sometimes that isn't enough having just the expert sometimes you need to see through vicarious learning somebody improving so somebody might think as with the previous slide well it's Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers they were experts in that field but by seeing something like I've chosen Strictly Come Dancing there you can see people who are novices improve so that people looking at somebody who's improving they can actually think to themselves well you know I can actually improve I can actually start to get better at it and also so inactive mastery we've all heard the term practice makes perfect even if you don't do any of the other things if you keep practicing and practicing something you get better at it like at one stage none of us were able to drive and the first lessons were probably quite terrifying for the driving instructor but the more <laughs> The more we did it, the better we got. So first steps. The Bandura curve is something where you start and you're not very good and you get better and better, so you rise up. So the first steps with a child, a first child when they start to begin to crawl, will just go to their favourite toy and pick it up. And then they actually get a little bit more curious and they actually stand up children and hold on to things like tables and chairs. And then one day they'll forget and let go and they realize they're actually standing then they suddenly realize that they can actually walk over and pick up their favorite toy just like mummy and daddy or their elder brother or sister however they take a step and then they fall straight over on their bottom so what is quite interesting is that it takes a little while for the first couple of steps to arise but once a child's actually got to about five or seven steps then more steps it becomes easier for them to progress and also as well this is to do with the fact that and though they've got the skill their little legs in their muscles haven't quite developed that strength just yet when people can see themselves getting better they start to take responsibility so for example if somebody wanted to lose some weight they know that everybody knows inside them what to do there is a there is a presupposition in NLP, presupposition, what do you presuppose, that anybody already has with inside them or can create the resources they need to do whatever they want. So people know that to lose weight you need to eat more healthy, maybe taking some exercise at the weekend, because maybe just the healthy diet will only get you so far in losing the weight. When people start to take responsibility, they start taking responsibility in other areas of their life, for example, getting a decent amount of sleep, feeling refreshed in the morning. And when you feel refreshed in the morning, you avoid this, people feeling tired and very drained at their work. Now, why it's called the Bandura curve? Because if it's measured, you can actually see the curve going up. With weight, you can see the weight coming down. <laughs> 
With gaining a skill, so for example, with snooker, you can actually see that your breaks are getting higher and higher. And with business, you might be getting better connections with people or you'd be getting more money in. And if you were to put it on a graph, you can see it going up. We all know the learning ladder. You have, first of all, the unconscious incompetence, then moving up to conscious incompetence, conscious competence, and then unconscious competence. So this is basically when you're starting off to drive, even before I started driving, I would just be in the car and mum and dad, when I was very small, I'd just go in the car, they took me to the destination. At that point, I actually had no thinking, I'm going to do this one day. And then I actually remembered being driven to school by my mum and thinking, you know, I wouldn't actually be able to stay on the road. I think that this is because I was used to doing drive-in games at this, that stage in the arcade and it's virtually impossible to stay on the road. But then your first lessons, you're still at this conscious incompetence stage. Then by the time you actually get to the conscious competence stage, that's usually the time when you start to actually take your test. Even when you're taking your test, you're very much aware of, right, I've got to 30, now I'll change the gear. It's now mirror signal manoeuvre. And then eventually you get to the unconscious competence and we can just do it on autopilot. There's been many times where I've just driven the same direction over and over again and I don't think about it one day. I'm supposed to be going somewhere else and then I find that I'm going back on this old journey. It's usually at this point that the bad mistakes come in. However, disappointment can come in with learning any new skill. There comes a point most of the time when we reach a plateau. For example, if you're losing weight, for the first week you may lose five pounds, the second week five pounds, but there's only so long that that will actually continue for before the body starts to balance out, so a plateau will be reached. At this particular stage, people's expectations are still further ahead, so they're thinking I'm going to lose five pounds and it doesn't happen. Then they actually start to doubt themselves. At the beginning, when people are all pumped up and fired up, it's very much at their capability at, their, at the stage of their development, I'm capable of doing this. When disappointment kicks in, it's more of the identity, or you can maybe want to call it self-image, who they really are that begins to get affected. It's at those stages people start thinking to themselves, do I deserve this? Am I somebody who's actually always going to be overweight? It could happen with business, with learning a new skill. And sometimes you have to adapt and learn new skills. For example, if you were playing snooker, just by hitting the ball in the centre of the cue ball to pop the balls will only get you so far. After a while, you're going to have to then adjust, put pace on to get to the next shot, put side on, which again, you have to adjust your angles when you put side on, and then you have to start thinking several steps ahead. And though at the moment when you actually learn those new skills, the brakes will go down, but eventually, your skills will go up because you're practicing, you're putting the side on, and the old thinking can only get you so far. At some stages as well, we have to think of other things we could possibly do. So going back to the being more healthy, eating, taking exercise, maybe there's other things in life people can do. Maybe there's things like they work in an office block and they actually walk to the second floor rather than taking the lift every day. So there's always extra things that you can do in that circumstances. When this starts to happen, people become very interested in the statistics. They want to know how many people will actually start being on their more healthier lifestyle and see it all the way through. It's also interesting as well that you may see a child as they begin to walk. Although walking at first the child is slow, slower than crawling, eventually walking will be quicker than the crawling would ever be. And sometimes even children get to this disappointed stage and they may actually go back to crawling before they start walking again. So when they get to this statistic stage, when people want to know how it's going to actually work for them, is it possible for it to work to me? Going back to those four techniques that were taught at the original point of the Bandura curve with the saying to somebody, you can do it, at that stage, if you're just saying to somebody with a verbal persuasion, you can do it, that won't have such a good impact with somebody. Again, I did say it was the lowest one, but people will just kind of hear, yes, you know, I'm hearing you saying to me that you can do it, you can do it, blah, blah, blah. But if it's so easy, why don't you actually go and do it then? 
So at this stage, verbal suasion or criticism wouldn't work. Also, the expert modelling isn't the best thing to do at this stage because somebody at that stage, as they're beginning to feel a bit doubtful about themselves, they're thinking, well, that person is an expert, I'm just me. So it's the vicarious learning, the inactive mastery are the better ones to do. If they can actually see somebody reach that plateau and go above it, then that will help their self-esteem and think, yes, I actually believe that I can do it, now I've seen them do it. Also, as well, people like to that point be a little bit more external. So for example, if somebody had quit smoking and they know somebody and they were ha having a real hard time, but they knew somebody who tried a technique that worked for them, they think it's worked for them, it will work for me too. And also as well is the practice, keep practicing that stage. And it's important at this stage not to lower your expectations. People tend to think I'm going to lower my expectations because I can't achieve it at this point. So if you get somebody to stay with higher expectations, eventually that plateau will start to then shift forward. And it's important to remind people as well that it's all part of the plateau stage of the Bandura curve. And that's all about getting people back on track. You can lift yourself back up again and get yourself back on track. There's also various other NLP techniques that I can use that I'm happy to talk to you about after, but that's not necessary to do with the Bandura curve. It's important to remember as well that the darkest hour is just before the dawn. Now, at the beginning, we said anything worth doing is worth doing, and you all said well. That's something we've been taught in schools, we've been taught by our parents, people we look up to. However, a good sensible way of thinking about it is anything worth doing is worth doing poorly at first. <laughs> Nobody's going to be an expert right at the beginning. You see somebody who's brilliant in sports. At one stage they were a novice. Also as well, thinking that you can do something poorly at first, how it takes to take that feeling you'll get enough tension about doing a new activity. You can never be an expert at first, it's just something that gets learned. So going back to the cricket, now I was really happy, I thought excellent, I'm going to show everybody my techniques and I put some spin on, got a lot faster. So after the Easter holidays I got on the cricket pitch, got hold of the ball and almost took the poor kid's head off. <laughs> Unfortunately I've been practicing with a tennis ball in my garden. A tennis ball is not the same weight as a cricket ball. <laughs> Now, why am I saying this? Things change in life. If you're reading a book about marketing, which was written 30 years ago, you're going to be on the wrong footing, just like I was on the wrong footing using the tennis ball. So it's important that you have the right tools to move yourself forward. Thank you.